Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Thank you for making time for this. Um, been looking forward to this. This is probably something we've needed to do for a while. Uh, and we didn't really have the right time for it and said, well, let's just make time on a Sunday night and spend some time talking about missions. So I'm going to pray and then we'll jump into our time uh, of this presentation tonight and uh, then we'll have some fellowship after. Lord, thank you for these brothers and sisters and for uh, the chance you've given us to come together here and to worship as a church, to function as a body here in Lawrence, Kansas. And I thank you, Lord, as well for uh, the tremendous resources you've blessed this church with in terms of a body of believers, their various gifts, and also in terms of the financial resources you've entrusted to us. We thank you for also the opportunities that you are presenting to us, and we, we want to be good stewards of that, and we are grateful for the chance you've given us to participate in your mission. So I pray your blessing on this evening that you would give us a clear understanding of what scripture calls us to, and also uh, just uh, allow us to rejoice in what is currently happening at Redemption Hill. And we pray that you'd give us an eagerness and an excitement for what you may do through us in the future. Amen. So the aim of our time together tonight is really just to share uh, our heart as a church for, for the ministry of missions, for gospel ministry abroad. Uh, I want you to, because sometimes we, that's not the focus of what we talk about on Sunday, the nuts and the bolts of what it is that we're, we're engaged in. We wanted to let you know sort of what our convictions are, what our desires are, really what our heart is for that, and also just give you um, a little bit of a biblical foundation for why we've chosen to approach missions ministry the way we have, which may be different than in some other churches. And we also want to just update you on, on things we've already been able to be engaged in and to invest in missions this year. Uh, the money that you all have faithfully given is being deployed, it's being used, and we have some pictures and some video just to show, hey, here's the things that are happening that we've been able to, to be a small part of. So first of all, I just wanted to talk a little bit about a biblical philosophy of missions. And there's really two parts to this. One is that missions involvement needs to follow a biblical pattern. So I want to show you where we see that pattern. And then secondly, missions involvement, uh, we want it to follow biblical priorities. So preachers like to alliterate things. So we have a biblical pattern <clears throat> and biblical priorities. And both of those things are very much forming what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. So first, just to talk about that biblical pattern. And we see this in the book of Acts. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. It's, it's mostly right here in Acts 13. Uh, you don't have to. I'll read these texts. Um, but in Acts chapter 13, we find uh, this biblical pattern. Uh, in the book of Acts, we find that the early church uh, was centered in Jerusalem. That's where the believers were. Uh, they were all gathered up there. But persecution came, which led to an explosion um, and, and God used that negative thing, the persecution of his saints, to actually spread the gospel to the surrounding region. So everywhere that people went, these Christians went, this diaspora, they took the gospel with them. And one of the cities uh, that some of these Christians landed in was the city of Antioch. And there was a new church that was birthed there. And as that church grew and matured, God used this church, um, as far as we know, in more significant ways than many of the other churches in that age, Use this church to send out men who would continue the mission of gospel expansion. In Acts chapter 13 and 14, we see this sending ministry starting to take place. And through the missionary efforts of Paul and Barnabas, who were from that church, sent out from that church, we see the gospel spread, churches are established, and existing churches are strengthened all throughout the Roman Empire. So it starts in Jerusalem. We see this church, Antioch, that's established, and Antioch becomes a launch pad for gospel ministry. And now what we find in Acts is what you might call descriptive instead of prescriptive. Those are two big words for the kids, but descriptive simply means telling us what happened so we understand what it was like. Prescriptive means this is what you should do. And descriptive and prescriptive are not necessarily the same thing. However, the example of the church in Acts does provide for us a very good picture, a very good example of what missions can look like. So this is where we're finding this biblical pattern, um, this biblical pattern that's rooted in the church from a local church perspective. And we think this model of ministry is one that's worth following today. So of course, it's flexible. It's not something that where it's sinful if you don't do it exactly the way the church at Antioch did, or that uh, it's, it's uh, wrong if you do something a little bit different. But at the same time, churches that have departed from the model we find in Acts, churches that have deviated from that example, 
um, we think that there's, a, there's often weaknesses that emerge in those different approaches to missions. Too many times today, missions becomes maybe just broadly defined as any good work done in the name of Jesus. And that's not the model of missions we see in Acts. We see the preaching of the gospel and the establishing of churches. It's, it's explicit gospel ministry in Acts. Too often today, missionaries are self-appointed. They choose to be missionaries. They decide where they're going to go, and then they go around and, and try to raise money for it. And they're not always recognized by a church, and they're not always sent by a church, which means that there's a potential problem with that. Sometimes there's issues in character. Sometimes there's deficiencies in their maturity. Sometimes these people, though they may have even good motives, they may not necessarily be called and fit for that ministry when it's self-appointed, and it's not from the context of the local church. When missions is severed from the local church, there's also often minimal accountability. No one knows how their marriage is doing. No one knows if they're faithfully serving or like some missionaries I heard about in Alaska, they mostly hunt and fish, and then twice a year they host VBS or an outreach ministry so they can send pictures back to their, their donors and their, the people that, um, that support them. There needs to be accountability from the church. And on the flip side of that, there's many faithful missionaries out there who sadly lack the support of a church. There's no one that really knows them and loves them and cares for them because their support is spread very thin across a multitude of churches which means their relationships are also spread thin across those same churches. So we think there's a deficiency when we don't follow this model of ministry that is really rooted in the church. Uh, so we think the book of Acts offers a better way. So just a few key observations. When we look at this uh, missionary activity in the book of Acts and at the church in Antioch, first we see that the missionary was proven in the context of the local church ministry prior to being sent. So Acts 13.1 it says, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Then he lists them. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Here's five men who were actively involved in ministering in the church at Antioch. They were preaching. They were teaching. They were shepherding. They were leading. They were evangelizing. And so these two men that were sent out, Paul and Barnabas, who's listed as Saul here, these men were a known commodity. They weren't someone who showed up off the street and said, I'm a missionary. No, this was someone that the people in that church that would end up supporting them, they had seen firsthand their faithfulness. They had benefited firsthand from their gifting. They had seen Paul, for example, we find in, in Acts chapter 11 that for an entire year after Paul's conversion, he served here in the church at Antioch. They got to see exactly who he was and what he was about and watch him develop as a leader. So uh, we believe that, that a good approach to missions following this pattern is that missionaries should be really proven in the context of local church ministry. The second principle that pops out here is that uh, the missionary's sense of calling from God is something that's confirmed by God to the local church. And again, jumping back into Acts 13.2, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. It was the Lord that impressed upon the church the fact that these two men of the five were the right men to go. They didn't send Lucius. They didn't send Menaean. They didn't send um, Simeon. They sent Barnabas and Saul or Paul. And that's because the Lord was giving direction to that. So this is something that as these men are proven in the church, the church itself recognizes the calling and the readiness of these men. And that call is confirmed by God to the local church. A third principle that comes out in this chapter is that the missionary is sent by the local church. In verse 3 of Acts 13, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. It's the church that commissions and sends and authorizes these men to go and carry out the gospel ministry that they did on their missionary journeys. We often think about Paul as this lone ranger who is this unique apostle, and he was unique, and he did minister in incredible ways, but he was recognized by a church, ministered in a church. The church recognized his calling, and the church laid hands on him and sent him. There's a, a fourth principle that emerges here is that the missionary returns home to the ministry of the local church following periods of ministry on the field. When Paul and Barnabas left, that wasn't the last time they ever set foot in Antioch. We see this in chapter 14, verses 26 through 28. 
It says, from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. So once Paul and Barnabas left, they made their, their, their travels on that first journey. They came back and they updated the saints. They said, listen to what God is doing. And they remained there, ministered to them, were ministered uh, to by them. And, and they benefited from being a part of that church, returning to that church. We see the same thing in Acts chapter 15 and Acts chapter 18. Whenever they come back after their missionary journey, they return to the church. So these are, this is a biblical pattern for missions that we think is healthy, that we think is ideal. And it's something that as we engage in missions, we want to, in some shape or form, we want to participate in this kind of a model. Not that other ways of doing it are necessarily wrong, but we think it's hard to improve on the model we see in the book of Acts. So that's a biblical pattern for missions that really informs our philosophy of ministry here. And there's also several biblical priorities, and I'll go more briefly through these. First of all, we believe that in missions, the glory of God is the primary aim. That's the aim, is what will bring glory to God. That's the reason to go. That's the reason to preach the gospel. That's the reason we might give. That's the reason we want to do any of the things we might do in terms of missions is to glorify God. And that's in keeping with what we believe scripture teaches. Um, and that is something that's reflected in our mission statement as a church, that we exist to glorify God by being and making disciples of Jesus. So the Great Commission is for the sake of the glory of God. So that's the primary aim. And then secondly, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the primary emphasis. Again, there's many good works that people do in the name of Jesus, but any good works that lack gospel proclamation that aren't driving towards what the Bible says is of first importance. Paul said, I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. We believe missions should be explicitly focused on the gospel. That's the primary emphasis of missions. So again, our mission statement reflects this. We want to glorify God by being and making disciples. How does someone become a disciple? By believing in the gospel, right? That's step one of being a disciple is get saved, become a Christian, believe in the gospel. So there is no making of disciples. There's no fulfillment of the Great Commission apart from the emphasis on the gospel. Third, biblical doctrine is to be valued and replicated. Again, if we're seeking to make disciples, Jesus said, teach them everything I commanded you. There is teaching that is involved with the ministry of the gospel. So we're not seeking simply to see people converted and then move on. We want to see disciples grown in maturity, doctrinal maturity. And if we're seeking to, to carry on this mission beyond just our generation, we need to see churches established. We need to see leaders trained up so that this process of multiplication can continue. And we want to see like-minded leaders raised up. We want to see like-minded churches established. So there's a, a certain doctrinal like-mindedness that, that we want to have with whoever we partner with in missions. Because we want to make sure that what we're investing in, what we're multiplying, is something that we believe is firmly biblical and faithfully biblical. And then a fourth priority would be that the church is central to God's plans. The church is the bride of Christ. That's what Jesus died for. Jesus promised in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church. That's the program. That's what Jesus is doing. And so we want to be part of what he's doing. Paul says the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth. That's where the truth is preserved. That's where the truth is proclaimed. That's where the, the truth is going to be taught. Um, and so the church is really central to God's purposes and plans. So in terms of our priorities in missions, we want to glorify God by seeing the gospel proclaimed and biblical doctrine taught so that the church is strengthened, so that churches are multiplied, because the church is going to be what carries the gospel forward, if the Lord tarries, into the next generation, and the generation after that. That's even one of the reasons we aim to plant a church in Lawrence, is because if we're going to reach people 95 years from now, how do we do that? How do we reach people, not just horizontally, but vertically through time? Well, we leave behind a faithful church that preaches the gospel and is biblically sound. That's the way we reach those people in those next coming generations. So we really want to invest in missions that is explicitly focused on the planting and the strengthening and the multiplying of churches. So those are our biblical priorities. So there's some long-term goals we have in keeping with this philosophy of ministry. We would love to see missionaries and church planters raised up and sent out from this church. 
Uh, we want to be part of that process in whatever way we can. And so we're always asking the question, who might God be calling and equipping and maturing among us? And do we need to participate in that? Can we recognize that calling and, and send them? We want to send them and support them at a high level. Again, if we look back in Acts, it seemed like the church at Antioch was the ones that, that sent and supported Paul and Barnabas. They didn't have to necessarily go and raise a lot of money. Paul either worked for his own self or they were supported by uh, the church at Antioch. And so we really love that model of ministry that says, you know, if we're sending someone, why wouldn't we support them? If we believe they're called, we believe they're ready, we believe in the mission they're doing, we believe in the gospel, and we know them and we love them, why wouldn't we fund them at the absolute highest level that we could? And again, this is something that we've benefited from. This church was planted under this same philosophy of ministry, where we didn't go raise money to plant this church. It was fully funded by our sending church. They said, we believe in the need. We believe this team is the team to go and do it. And we believe the time is now. So we're going to invest in you. And so we benefited from that. We would love to do the same thing and send and support missionaries and church planters at a high level. If we're not able to fully fund it, at least fund it to the greatest degree that we can. We'd love that model. That'd be a long-term goal to be able to do something like that. Um, we'd love to see gospel preaching churches established and strengthened that continue that mission of multiplication. So we really want to invest in this. These are long-term goals for us. Um, as you know, right now, we're not exactly doing that. It's not because we don't want to or believe in it, but some of these things are a matter of God's timing, and God has provided certain components of this, but not other pieces, and so we are eagerly praying that, that God would move us closer, whatever those next steps are, closer to being able to do that. But simply because we can't do that long-range ideal model of missions just yet, because we don't have someone who's ready to go overseas or we're not ready to plant a church next week, um, does that mean we do nothing right now? Well, we've decided the answer to that is no. There's current opportunities we, opportunities we have. We want to use our resources um, to invest in, in the ministry of the gospel. So there's two different uh, ministries we've been investing in. One is Mexico, the ministry of the Warrens, and the other is Brazil, the ministry of the Johansons. Um, and so I'd like to just share a little bit more about those ministries because some of you guys know them. How many, how many of you know the Warrens and the Johansons personally? Maybe a dozen of us in here. So many of you guys don't know them. So this will hopefully be helpful. Brian and Daniel Warren, um, they've been serving in Mexico since 1999. So they've been down there for a while. I'm going to flip over here because I have a few extra notes. I want to make sure I get all the details right. Um, I know them well, and so it's, I have to remember, what are the things other people don't know so that I can share uh, those details? Um, so Brian and Daniel Warren are fully funded by the same ministry that funded us. So they are fully supported in terms of their, um, their salary and their, their living expenses. But also there's a, a ministry fund that they have access to that Countryside provide so that they have um, resources even to engage in ministry. However, in the ministry they're involved in, there's things that go even beyond that. Um, but they are sent and supported by the same church that sent and supported us. They went down to Mexico in 1999. Uh, they're in the state of Sinaloa. You might have heard of the Sinaloa cartel. It's that Sinaloa. Um, it's a, a headquarters for a lot of cartel activity, unfortunately. And they've been there strengthening churches, planting churches. And now Brian's ministry has really evolved to include training leaders, not just leaders in their area of Mexico, but leaders in Central and South America. Uh, we tease him that he's become like the South American John MacArthur because everybody wants him to come preach and everybody wants to be trained under him. And he's really having a broad influence outside of his own village, which is truly amazing um, because for many years he was in this little teeny village in the desert with maybe 150, 250 people who lived there called Hawada. Actually, there's two Hawadas, so they call it Hawada Dos, number two. Um, teeny little village laboring in a very small church that when they arrived, they, were, they went there to learn the, the language. They learned there to serve alongside an older missionary. He ended up leaving the field not long, retiring not long after they got there. The church was very unhealthy. They saw that church strengthened, revitalized. They saw it grow and were able to plant the church out of that church um, in a city called Mochikawi. You might have heard that name as we pray for them uh, from the pulpit here. Mochikawi, you can see where it's at there. Um, they are about nine hours south of the border. So many of you have been to Mexico, probably some of the border towns. This is way further south than that. It's about 470 miles south of the border. And the, the population where they minister there in Mochikawi is a lot of the Mayo Indian people. It's an indigenous people group that most of them speak Spanish now. Only a few of the older 
uh, old, very older uh, people know a little bit of the, the original language there. Uh, but they're uh, ministering now in Mochikawi, which is a village a little bit bigger than Hawada, um, but it's still only a couple thousand people. I believe it's around 6,000 people live there in Mochikawi. And it's just a little bit north of another city you might have heard of called Los Mochis. Los Mochis is bigger. Um, there's a couple hundred thousand people there. They have Walmart and they have Home Depot. They have Starbucks. And they also have cartel kingpins. If you remember, uh, El Chapo was in prison and famously escaped. That was in Los Mochis. So there's an airport there. Um, and Los Mochis is where they are uh, now getting ready. Well, they, just this month, they are planting a church. So what we've been able to do is help fund this church plant that Brian and Danielle's church in Mochikawi is invested in. We've been able to send down this last month $20,000 for Redemption Bible Church. Kind of funny. It's a similar name to ours. That's not because we have any, uh, we had no say in that. We didn't know about it. It's just kind of cool coincidence. But there's a $50,000 line item in our budget for gospel ministry. And when we learned that there was an opportunity to basically fund this church for an entire year, $20,000 will fund an entire year of ministry in Los Mochis, in this church. We were excited to do that. Um, 10,800 of that is just for the rent. They're renting a building downtown. About 900 of that was for a deposit. We bought some chairs uh, to furnish it. They spent about 1,800 in uh, AV equipment so that they could um, so they could record and, and broadcast even some of their sermons and their teaching. Um, they needed fans. It is very warm down in this part of Mexico. I mean, like 120 degrees, and it, it's pretty brutal. So fans and AC units were also a big part of that. And then they didn't ask for this, but we gave them a little bit more because we knew that Brian never asks for as much as he's actually going to need because we know him. So we topped it off just a little bit because we know there's going to be other uh, startup expenses as they're getting this new church started. So there's $20,000 of the monies that you all have been giving to the Lord that's being deployed right now in Los Mochis, Mexico to start a new church, uh, Redemption Bible Church. Here's a few of the people that are involved in the ministry there, along with uh, Brian and Danielle, Pastor Antonio and Alicia. Um, they're partners in ministry down there. Uh, they're going to be involved there in that church. Uh, and I know Pastor Antonio, I've spent a lot of time with him. He's a wonderful brother. Uh, also, pastoral resident Tony and his wife Avi and their kids, they're involved there. And the hope, uh, I believe, is that Tony might be able to stay in that church and help lead that church into the future down the road. Also, Pastor Yosimar and Paula and their children, they're involved in helping this church plant get started up. Um, these are believers that have grown and been mentored and trained by Pastor Brian and his wife, Danielle. So some of these young faces you're seeing, these are people that the Warrens pour themselves into, that they spend immense amounts of time with, discipling, mentoring, uh, counseling, and then giving them a chance to engage in ministry and then walking them through that growth process. Uh, there's a few deacons that are helping with the church plant as well. Seth and Mavi and their children are, are helping with this church plant, as well as Will. We have a deacon named Will, so I think they're bound to do well because Will has been a blessing in our church, and I'm sure this Will will be a blessing in their church as well. So this is sort of the core team that's going to be helping lead that church plant. Um, this is the, uh, another deacon named Carlos praying for the church plant team. This is in Mochikawi. This is the church building there. It's, it's outdoor. They have a roof and one or two walls, and someday they'll close it in. But for now, this is where they meet. <clears throat> and this is them praying just a few weeks ago for the, the church planting team. This is the team that has, is being commissioned to plant Redemption Bible Church in Los Mochis. So the plan is they are having their, their Sunday morning services in Mochikawi, and the whole group is together. Um, many of the people in the Los Mochis church have actually been commuting. It's about a 20 to 30 minute drive to Mochikawi. They've been commuting to Mochikawi for church. Um, so right now they're starting to have Sunday night church. They actually started last week was their first service in Los Mochis, and they're doing that on Sunday night. So the ministry team is leading the church in Sunday morning in Mochikawi, and then leading the church service in Los Mochis in the evening. And then the plan is, as that takes root, is for some of this team to split off and them to sort of hand the reins off, and they will take that church and begin um, meeting independently. Now, this is the building that they're renting, Iglesia Biblica de Redención. That's Redemption Bible Church there. So they're renting this church for the next year. We've been able to fund that. We're very thankful for that. They've got a courtyard out back, which is great for kids' ministry. It's great for uh, church fellowship events and outreach and different things like that. So it's great to have kind of a little private space like that. Here's the interior. 
This was actually the, uh, the first event they held in this new building, and it was a marriage study. So it was an evening event, and they had some couples come in and sit uh, under Pastor Brian's teaching to, to be instructed and encouraged regarding marriage. And I believe this is the video. So this is last Sunday night. They had their first church service there at Redemption Bible Church. part of our church plant when we first started, a little group that size in, in a building like that brings back a lot of memories. It's such an exciting season for the church when you're gathering together really for the first time as a new group in a new city. So we're very excited to see what the Lord's going to do there in Los Mochis. So you can be praying for those leaders, praying for that church, and rejoice with us that the Lord has blessed us financially to the point where we can really help um, put some wind in their sails and support the wor that work of ministry um, support, support many of their expenses uh, over this next year. So that's the ministry in Mexico that we're involved in. Um, and there may be opportunities in the future for some of you to go and to go visit. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to go again, hopefully soon, as I know many of those people and I've been to those places, but I want to go now that this new church has started and go see the work, and I'm looking forward to that. The second ministry uh, that we've been involved with is Pastor Roger and Crystal Johansson. And they also uh, are sent out from the same church that sent us from Countryside. And they have been in Brazil, and they are now, uh, for many years, um, 94, I believe, and they're now in a city called Aracaju. Aracaju is the capital of the state of Sergipe. Um, there's about 600,000 people in this city. Um, and it's 170 miles south of the city where they spent the first 25 years of ministry. Think about ministering for 25 years, learning the language, seeing multiple churches planted and strengthened in a city. Maceo has, I think, 1.2, 1.3 million people, so it's kind of like Kansas City-ish. Uh, it's on the coast. If you're, looking at, um, if you're looking at Brazil, like right up on the point of the hump is where Maceo would be. Now they're further south than that. They just moved in 2019 to Aracaju. Um, Aracaju is a city where they are now planting um, Yes, and there's those, that information. Here's some of the people serving with them, Pastor Eddie Oma Maya and his family. Pastor Eddie Oma served for many years with them in the city of Maceo. He was part of the church and led the church uh, in Klima Balm. It's a, a very poor neighborhood. Um, Maceo is interesting because some parts of it are like a, a vacation resort place. There's beaches and like condos and all these really nice restaurants. And then other parts of the city, like two blocks over, is some of the poorest people you've ever seen in your life with dirt floors and no shoes, and it's really interesting. So Klima Bohm is a church in the, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Maceo, and Pastor Eni Amas served there for many years leading that church. And he and his family have moved with Roger and his family, moved to a new city to start the church in Aracaju. Pastor Marcos and his family are also part of that team. So there's really three of them that are leading this effort in Aracaju. Um, and what we've been able to do for their ministry this year um, is to fund them uh, $12,700, and the name of their church is Hope Bible Church. Um, we've been able to help with a number of supplies. They had a bunch of chairs that were breaking, chairs that, uh, that were uncomfortable for some of the older people. They were able to get some chairs, kind of like these actually, that had cloth and were a little bit padded that they, kept, they, they can keep inside. <clears throat> that they were very excited about, as well as some AV equipment for them as well, to be able to make the ministry of the word heard clearly. And also, as you guys know, people listen to sermons. People check out your church online. How many of you guys listened to a sermon here or watched online before you came? That's what a lot of people do. So some of this equipment is even like, hey, can we get you know, a camera and, and, and a mixer maybe that allows us to capture that audio so that we can 
show people what's going on in the church and so that the ministry of the gospel can even go outside the walls of our building. So that's what some of that equipment is being used for. And then there's a big chunk of it, $5,000, that, that helped offset the cost for a missions trip that they took with their church to Portugal. So in Brazil, they speak Portuguese. And there's a few other countries that speak Portuguese as well. Portugal is one, and there's some nations in Africa that speak Portuguese. And what I love about Roger is his heart for missions means that by the time his church plant is taking its first baby steps, he's already thinking, when is this church going to be able to send missionaries and plant churches? And so he's trying to stir up a heart for missions in that church and also really exploring some opportunities they might have. Roger, if you know him, he goes about 185 miles an hour, and he's a big vision guy, always thinking about what's next. So they're always exploring different places. Where might be the next place that the Lord would have us plant a church? So here's um, some of them standing outside the storefront that they rent there in Aracaju, Igreja Biblica Esperanza, that's Hope uh, Bible Church. Uh, there's the inside of their church. They have, seems like a very similar building even to what's in Mexico. Uh, that's their old chairs. Here's um, Pastor Roger teaching in their Bible Institute. They have young people, college students coming in, being equipped in, in learning to understand the Bible, how to study the Bible, biblical doctrine. And there is the church plant team that they took to Portugal. And Roger included a little video as well. And I'll show you. There's not, I think it's going there. Um, not a lot to see here, but here's some of the team. So that's some of the team that they took to Portugal. How many of you guys have ever been on a short-term missions trip? Straight, let me see your raise of hands real quick. You've ever gone, you've visited a missionary, been to another country. You probably understand a little bit about why Roger wanted to bring people. Not only are they exploring Portugal to see where is there a need, where might we be able to plant a church, but he's also wanting to encourage and stir up a heart for missions. If you've never been on a missions trip, um, there's so much value in going and seeing the work of the gospel, fellowshipping with those whose boots are on the ground, seeing the, the need for the gospel, and just getting excited about those opportunities. When you come home, it helps you see your own community differently. And so we were excited to be able to help offset the cost for some of the people who went on this trip would have never been able to do that. I mean, the, the monies that they make in their country, they could have never afforded plane tickets, could have never afforded the, the lodging and the airfare and all of that. So we were excited to be able to offset that cost and help them go on this missions trip. You'll also get a chance if you go on a missions trip to speak in tongues because you will worship in a different language, which is wonderful. And what you realize as you go on these trips is that culture is different, the food is different, the customs are different, but the gospel is the same and people are the same. People need to hear the gospel. People need to be taught the word. They need biblical preaching. They need biblical doctrine. They need to be gathering together and loving each other. It's really the same thing we do here. And it's really a wonderful experience to get to participate in something like that. So that's a little bit of the trip there that they took to Portugal. So those are just some updates on things we've been able to invest in over this last year. And over the next year, uh, we're looking for more opportunities. How might we be able to come alongside some of these faithful ministries? These brothers, uh, Brian and Roger, are men we trust their character. We trust their doctrine. We trust their accountability structure. We know they're sending church. So for us, this seems like a very uh, easy way for us to feel confident about sending the Lord's resources that he's entrusted to us, knowing that they're going to be used well and used in ways that further uh, the same kind of ministry that we are passionate about here. And if you're saying, wow, I love these pictures and videos, how do I keep up to date with what's going on? Uh, Michael Dietzel has been hard at work building out a whole new section on our website that has to do with missions. So if up on, our, on, the, on the menu under the About tab, you can now click on Missions, and there will be, um, there's a little overview of Brian and Danielle's ministry, an overview of Roger and Crystal's ministry, and then Michael will be adding updates there where you can see more pictures than what we showed tonight. You can get more details even than what we shared. So that is, that is there, and it also has prayer requests. There's needs for you guys not just to, to give towards this, but to pray. 
uh, specifically to pray for names, to pray for even time-sensitive needs. Those will be posted here. You can use that as a resource in your private prayer for your family or with your small group. So be sure to take advantage of that. And you can also pray for us. Um, it's not just these two ministries that we want to give to. There are many faithful ministries out there. We're actually in the process right now of really uh, investigating and exploring an exciting opportunity that um, there's someone in this church who has a close ministry relationship with a very exciting ministry overseas that is training uh, pastors and church planters doing theological education. And uh, the money that, that, that comes into that ministry, they use to feed and house the impoverished uh, leaders that are coming who, who, who hardly have, have any, have, hardly have two pennies to rub together. So we're exploring some opportunities for things like that. So would you pray for us, uh, for me and Stephen, that we would have wisdom as your pastors to deploy these funds in ways that would honor the Lord and bear much fruit. Uh, but th that's really the, the bulk of what I wanted to share tonight. That's the presentation. Uh, if you have questions about any of that, feel free to ask me, feel free to ask Pastor Stephen. Um, and we'd love to share that. One thing I want to read just in closing is a, uh, a thank you letter that we got from, um, from Pastor Brian. Both Roger and Brian have expressed a lot of appreciation. But here's a, a letter that Pastor Brian sent from Mexico. He writes, To the Redemption Hill Church family, thank you so much for your sacrificial and prayerful participation with Danielle and I, as well as our church family in Mochicaui, Sinaloa, Mexico, as we endeavor together to plant another church in our region. Our church planting team of two pastors, two pastoral residents, and two deacons from Word of Christ Biblical Church will continue to serve our church body in Mochicaui on Sunday mornings. We'll do Sunday school and the Sunday morning service. And then we will also begin Sunday evening services in the city of Los Mochis to launch the planting of Redemption Biblical Church. We are so thankful for your generosity to our Lord in helping us have a suitable location and some necessary equipment to begin this new ministry we look forward to sharing updates along the way to help you pray for us and praise the Lord with us for the work he will do in reaching others with the gospel and seeing his servants grow in their knowledge and application of the Bible for his glory. The first weekly service for the new church plant will be held on November 5th. That's last week. Danielle and I will be in Honduras during the first three services being held for the new church. I will be teaching a two-week seminary class and preaching three Sundays in different cities throughout the country. We will also be visiting family members and churches of three Honduran pastors who have served with us as pastoral residents in the past and are now planting churches in Mexico and Peru. Pastor Antonio will preach the first service at the new church, followed by our two residents, Yosimar and Tony. Upon our return to Mexico, I will preach the fourth service. Thank you for your continued prayers for spiritual wisdom and physical strength as together we seek to see Latin American men called and trained for the work of planting new churches throughout Latin America and eventually from here to other parts of the world. Your fellow servants, Brian and Daniel Warren. So we're excited to continue sharing those updates. I hope that's been encouraging to you and gives you a bit of a, a hope you catch a glimpse of the vision of what we have for missions here and just rejoice with us in what uh, we're able to do right now. So with that, we'll go ahead and be dismissed. I'm gonna pray. We can go downstairs and enjoy uh, some continued fellowship and enjoy those desserts. So we'll pray. Lord, thank you so much for um, bringing these saints here together tonight. Thank you for what you're doing in Mexico and in Brazil and in every nation around the world where you have your servants stationed. I pray that you would help us to be faithful here in Lawrence and in the surrounding communities where we live and minister and help us to uh, find the part that you have for us to play in sending and supporting and strengthening um, your servants in other places. We pray that you would continue to magnify your glory through the advance of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.